The Utah Story Show is brought to you in part by Utah State, home of the Aggies. So living on campus means more sleep, more friends, and better grades because you are not commuting. While others are driving or walking on campus, you're getting those precious extra minutes of sleep. Instead of going home to your mom or your cat, you're hanging out with roommates, neighbors, and friends. So 84% of USU students live away from home, making on-campus housing a community of academic support, peer mentors, friends, and constant activities. For a virtual tour, room details, theme options, and to apply, visit usu.edu forward slash housing. The Utah Story Show is brought to you in part by Paisley's Grass-Fed Beef. At Paisley's, all animals are raised in southern Utah free of antibiotics, added hormones, and all animals live on the doorstep of Capitol Reef National Park, and the best part, eating grass their entire lives. So they raise their animals and they run the entire business with three core values in mind, flavor, tradition, and sustainability. So Paisley's offers ribeye steaks, beef jerky, New York strips, chuck roast, everything that you would want. And you can find them for sale at the Liberty Park Farmer's Market on Fridays, the downtown Salt Lake City Farmer's Market on Saturdays, the Park Silly Market on Sundays, and all sorts of events throughout the summer and winter, including our upcoming Made in Utah Winterfest. Shop now at paisleys.com, P-A-I-Z-L-E-E-S.com. He has a special going on right now on ribeye steaks, so go check it out. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Utah Stories Show. My name is Richard Marcosian. Um, So lawmakers return to the drawing board. The special session of the state legislature to examine medical cannabis is about to happen. Um, They realize that their compromise bill that they wrote after we passed Proposition 2 was highly flawed and full of poison pills. And on the show today, I have a very exciting guest. He is the man in charge of the rollout of medical cannabis in Utah. His name is Andrew Rigby. And um, I discussed with him all of the problems that we saw in the original bill. We saw uh, uh, that not only was the state going to illegally force state medical facilities to distribute a Schedule One substance, which no other state in the nation was going to do, which was highly flawed and ignorant, um, but that the controls of the way in which they're they're allowing the grow licenses to go is makes it extremely difficult for small growers, local farmers to get involved in this. So Drew was in charge of issuing those permits. He explains the justification of why only seven out of 10 permits were issued. And it's a very fascinating discussion if you're interested in medical cannabis in Utah. So the first part of this interview is cut off. So we're going to cut into this interview underway. Sorry about the audio difficulties we had, but Drew and I are talking about uh, the rollout of Prop 2 and how it's going to happen in Utah. Okay. Um, so you were uh, you were in finance? Is that your background? Right? Yeah, investment finance. So mm-hmm. started making these loans to uh, growers in California. California, sorry. And uh, when you're loaning that type of money to cultivators... They're not the most known quantities. These people you're loaning to, you have to get to know them, right? And so you spend a lot of time going out there and doing due diligence, making sure that you have everything in order, making sure that you have a high probability of getting your money back plus interest, Mm -hmm. those types of things. So you spend a lot of time out there learning the business and uh, developing a degree of confidence in in probability of you know succeeding. Mm -hmm. And so by way of that, you learn the business, and one thing leads to another. You're eventually helping them business plan, develop operation plans, execute those plans and stuff like that, right? Because it's all in your interest. You want your money back and X, Y, Z. So uh, that eventually led to um, me and a few partners forming our own businesses in California, Nevada, and uh, somewhat in Utah. And uh, yeah, so my experience goes back to that, and that would be specific to the THC and the industrial hemp space. Um, 
On both sides of the fence. So, so you, it, the space that you entered was cultivation, or was it? Oh yeah. So cultivation, processing, distribution, retail. Oh, all of it. Yeah. yeah. It was a fairly uh, large, large business entity. We had uh, a number of licenses um, throughout California, Nevada, and we moved a lot of a lot of pounds and distributed a lot of uh, products. That's for sure. So. That's cool. And is it considered? Was it still considered a risky, a pretty high risk venture? Yeah, I would say it still is. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I think like a lot of places still go out of business who try to get in this space. And yeah, there's a froth, a um, um, a frenzy, if you will. Uh, I think I see. I still see a lot of people bringing capital to the market, wanting to invest and not necessarily miss the the train, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so people are willing to do um, irrational things to try to stake out their space, so to speak. And, you know, timing's important, so I gotta do it now type of a thing. And trusting unknown individuals for whatever reasons, their friends of friends of friends or whatever. And so you still see a lot of that happen, happening. So I would, I would say it's still a risky space. Um, you can mitigate that risk by um, knowing what you're doing and having discipline and working with people who have proven track records. But um, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity in cannabis. There's the, the the ship is not sailed, so to speak, right? There's still plenty of opportunity, and um, and I, I would think that there will be plenty of opportunity to deploy capital and have good investments up until the feds get involved. And once the feds legalize everything at a national level, then you'll see a big change. I mean, you're already seeing this change develop um, already, but. Once that happens at a at a national level, you'll see a drastic change from from where power is actually domiciled to where wherever it's being taken, so to speak. So, well, I, and I would think that when it's legalized federally, these very expensive licenses that you guys are giving out to cultivators, to pharmacies, to distributors, there mm-hmm. those will be kind of worthless, won't they? Yeah, I mean, depending on how the feds decide to roll it out, I mean, that's anyone's guess at this point. Um, I can see arguments on all sides of the fence as to how they'll choose to deal with it. I don't know, I don't want to speculate, and I think it's so premature. I I mean, we may be one president off of having national legalization, we might be 12 years, three three terms out, I, I don't know. It really depends on who's in office and what the dynamics of uh, the nation look like, including the economic dynamics uh, of, of said time period. But um, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and whether you like it or not, it's coming. Um, so the all kind of a thing where you might see more of a federal presence, but with some opportunity for states to kind of tweak things here and there, that's probably most likely what will happen and if that's the case then yeah these state medical licenses won't really be worth much but there's a lot of companies out there who are banking on the fact that when it is legalized nationally because the system is already built out the feds could in some shape or form defer to said system it's already built out that would be from a state to state level and there would be obviously some efficiencies that would be um, revisited and um, you know, uh, rather maybe a better choice of words would be just like re, uh, rebuilding some aspects from state to state and how states function amongst each other, interstate commerce and those types of things. I don't know. They could be worthless. I guess it's all speculation at this point. So, and and just to give our our listeners and viewers a little background. So, the way that cannabis is currently classified is it's still a Schedule One. T- T- medical THC is yeah. medical THC. Uh, I guess any THC, yeah, recreational or medical. Yeah. And meaning that the the way the federal government still looks at it is that it's in the same category of drugs as heroin, heroin, cocaine, meth. Yeah, and the the interesting thing is there, the interesting thing here is that a Schedule One substance, by definition, has no medical value, no medicinal value, which obviously is ridiculous. So, how long can that last for? Probably not very long. They just descheduled industrial hemp, and cannabidiol derived via industrial hemp has been descheduled, and obviously that's part of the 2018 Farm Bill. So, so anybody can grow industrial hemp in their backyard now. 
Not literally speaking, but um, yeah, if you have a clear um, rap sheet by way of you know misdemeanors, felonies, that type of thing, uh, and then depending on the state you're in, you may be able to grow it in your backyard. We we do have a few licensees who are who quote unquote are growing it in their backyard because of their um, their location of their residence in rural areas. So yeah, but yeah. We did a story on a, a friend of mine who lives in Moab who's uh -huh. been a winemaker mm -hmm. for the last. 20 years almost, okay. and he really loves moving into the hemp space. He's like, right. you know, an hour from the Colorado border, and he's seen this amazing burgeoning market. Yep. And you know, it's been it's been difficult, of course, also to speculate the size of the market mm -hmm. that's going to come to Utah. I mean, obviously, Colorado being one of the, the forerunners in that in that area and passing legalization now, what six seven years ago, yep. mm -hmm. it won't be anything like yep. that. But does it feel like kind of the gold rush mentality oh, I, that a lot of people are racing to it? Absolutely, without a doubt, 100%. I think that's part of my hesitation when I quote unquote consult with growers here in Utah um, as an employee of the state. I have to be very careful because I don't want to influence any um, decisions that would be um, reckless or anything like that because it, it's, a, it's a sticky situation. You want to encourage agricultural uh, communities and farmers to take advantage of the situation but no one knows how long this one doesn't last for and that is because um, we're just getting out of this era in which um, industrial hemp technically speaking was still a schedule one substance it was not descheduled until December of last year with that there's no one keeping record of uh, there's no like government entity or any institution, any authority who's keeping record of all the different transactions. So we don't have a good pulse on how much product is actually moving per transaction, the average cost of said product uh, as, um, as defined by its variables, right? Uh, CBD percentage, um, all the other variables that come along with, you know, what a pound sells for, whether it's smokable flour or product to biomass to be ran and, and processed, those types of things. There's there's so many different kinds of product that is sold in the market. It's not just one type of product and it's not just by pound, right? Mm -hmm. You've got oils, you've got distillates, you've got crude oils, you've got isolates, you've got derivatives thereof, and so on and so on. And so uh, that's the danger in, or a byproduct of the environment, so to speak, in which you have everyone wanting to participate and make money, but no one really knows the market. The right. market. I mean, yeah. we can speculate and we can make really good educated decisions, which is what I've done in, in my past and we've been right about it, but by no means did I sleep well at night. Like it was, there was always a little bit of risk. There's too many variables. Yeah, there was, a, all, there was plenty involved and so you, it would keep you up at night, mm -hmm. definitely. Whether we're talking like a, a $50,000 transaction or a million dollar transaction, it didn't matter. It's just, you just never know. You never know. So. Uh, that's part of um, the risk involved in, in encouraging people to participate, mm -hmm. but yet knowing that if they don't know what they're doing, it, it could be painful. So that hurts sometimes. Yeah, and, and I was, um, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. because of what we do with the magazine. We right. celebrate local everything, mm -hmm. and I, I was you know, super happy to see Proposition 2 pass. Correct. But then the when the compromise bill got rolled out, I just saw so many poison pills baked into that cake. Yeah. It just looked terrible at, at, at first glance. And um, I know you you work for the Department <coughs> of Agriculture. You're you're an advocate for for policy, good mm -hmm. policy. Yeah, did absolutely. you did you think that that was good policy? <laughs> <laughs> you put me in that corner. Um, you don't have to. No, uh, let me let me respond like this. Um, I'm extremely grateful, and I, I think as as citizens of Utah, I think we should feel fortunate that in 2018 we actually got a medical marijuana bill passed. Yeah. Like having come from the industry and always lived in Utah. Had you asked me, you know, even two years ago, will Utah ever have a medical program, let alone a recreational program? I would have said, hell no, like not anytime soon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's not that's not to say that I doubted the people. I think our culture 
is open to that those types of things but just with all the exterior influences that that make utah what it is i it just maybe it was ignorant on my part but i i, I didn't feel very confident when i saw proposition two actually making ground i started changing my opinion really quick because there was there was momentum and it was being talked about uh, i was getting hit up all the time about my opinion which was in you know a indirect maybe indicator of what people were thinking or their openness to having those conversations but um, in regards to the bill that was passed uh, I'll leave that alone um, knowing that what's coming is good yeah I so. mean I, I can say I'm just extremely pleased the central yeah. fill concept was <laughs> ditched Oh man, that to, was... ha to have a DABC of cannabis oh yeah oh my gosh it it, uh, I'm glad it's gone. Let's yeah. just leave it at that. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is, I, I think in order for us to be proud of what's coming, that needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And without that having happened, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So my hope is that whether we like it or not, people can see it for what it is uh, by way that it needed to happen. Something like that had to happen. The, can, the, the central fill. Something, go, in, you know, well, or, not even the central fill, but just the compromise, the, or, or the proposition two and the compromise bill. Uh -huh. Because together, like, people tend to separate them, but I think as an insider, like, people knew what was coming. They knew that if they passed proposition, if the ballot initiative got passed, they knew that there would be a, uh, a compromise and that that would start the conversation uh, into something bigger and better that, that would make both sides of the aisle happy. And, and I, will, um, I will reiterate, and I've said this all along, that as I've been involved in um, bringing policy, better policy to the table, everyone, this is gonna sound so stereotypical uh, of anyone who does this, who's preaching this type of material, but everyone has been reasonable throughout this entire process with what we've got coming. Uh, what we have coming down the pipeline um, in this special session, uh, we haven't had a lot of pushback by really anyone. Everyone's been very reasonable and cordial and willing to listen mm -hmm. because I think people understand that um, what we have right now is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we need to waste time in assigning liability or um, it's your fault or yeah. it's his fault or I think whatever. We're now past that. We're right. We're really happy we are. And, and we've got something good going and I'm really excited about being able to talk about these things openly here in the next you know month or so, maybe in a couple of weeks. But um, I think people will be pleasantly surprised and I'm sure there's going to be uh, a part of the population that has maybe some issues with it. and. I can understand that. I can understand why they would have some issues with some of the stuff that's coming. But our goal as a state and as policymakers is to create the best program possible. Period. Mm -hmm. Right? Within Utah, within the nation. And, and by just defining the word best, best for who? Uh, the, <laughs> everyone involved in the equation. Uh, patients, growers, distributors. Patients, primarily, state. right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think if you could put patients on the pedestal, oh, the highest uh, rung of the ladder. Thing if if anyone, if, if 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 uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but if anyone approaches me saying accusing us that we didn't put patients first, uh, I just they just haven't they've been vacationing or have had their head under the rock for like as soon as these 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 changes come out, uh, the patient has been. At, at the pinnacle, the first and foremost of everything that we've talked about, they are the the main priority in every conversation that we have. And um, there's been this uh, mantra that has been um, um, kind of brought up time and time again that if it's a medicine, we're going to treat it like a medicine. So I I can testify that that has been uh, the spirit of 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 the work that's been done. And um, that both has its pros and cons, right? It, it has its pros by way of like, we can get a lot out of this by working under that premise, but there's also some things that are gonna be somewhat restrictive because it is treated like a medicine. For now, the progress that we're making, I think is monumental and in the right direction. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess we'll just have to have another conversation as soon as some of the stuff is public. And 
I mean, the part that I'm I'm really interested in um, is the cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. the, the The Mormon Church was vehemently opposed to medical cannabis even mm -hmm. two years ago, mm -hmm. and Mitt Romney on the campaign trail mm -hmm. when he was running for president mm -hmm. just said, "No way, shape, or form are we going to allow children to have." access to to cannabis if we're gonna and we're never gonna call it a medicine right. that's completely shifted and it's pretty amazing to see that and it and it seems like it's kind of been led at least in the Mormon church community mm -hmm. by the the LDS patients for medical cannabis like pe members of the church yeah there have been Is that yeah accurate? I think that's accurate I mean I don't want to discredit or over credit any specific group um, I think this as much as anything is people actually taking a stand and, and, and speaking up for what they believe has been a big part of it. This is also like a function of like things taking its natural course. Like it's, there's a big to, uh, you know, what to do about this and everyone, there's a frenzy and concerns and talk and then things start getting worked out, right? And things get better and better and better, right? So I, I think some of that can be ascribed to like what's going on too, but the patients the patient advocacy groups have been monumental and very important. There's there's a number of people that have been very important, and I won't name names as to not leave anybody out, but they know who they are. Um, but I will say that the, the church, and this is not because I'm active LDS, I really don't give a shit what people have to say about this, they haven't been a part of this conversation at all. Oh, they yeah. haven't? Not at all. Marty Stevens and not at all. that group? Not at all. But and and may, I, maybe I shouldn't be saying that because now they're going to be like, oh wait. Um, but they haven't. Uh, it's That's it's. Right. But but members. Believe it or not, members of the state legislature. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's definitely, <laughs> without a doubt, uh, um, uh, an LDS theme here. Like, there's lawmakers who are LDS. There's, that's not that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, but the church is an institution. They haven't. Overtly, no, been not since I've been involved, and and I was not involved in the Proposition Two, and um, and uh, Compromise Bill. I was involved indirectly by way of like doing some consulting for everyone involved. I was still in private industry, and then I sold out in January. And the timing was serendipitous for for me to come do this because I had to non compete for a number of years in the private industry after having sold out that this was the only thing that I could do if I wanted to keep my foot in the cannabis space. So okay. I was happy to do it. So that's why I'm here. That's the truth at the end of the day. And, um, but since I've been involved and since we've been working on these changes going months and months back before the county attorneys came out and said, um, we're not gonna you know, advise the local health departments to get involved. Like we've been working on these changes knowing that stuff had to change. And, and so the, yeah, the stuff's been coming down the pipeline for a while. And it's not like, no one involved is like trying to pat themselves on the back here. It's just saying, okay, we, we recognize some issues here. We don't want to waste taxpayers' dollars. There's, a, there's a, a more efficient way to do this while achieving the objectives of what the lawmakers set forth. Since then, the church has not, that I, they've never ever reached out to me and said a damn thing, nor have they actually had a, uh, an active stance in any of the dialogue or narrative that I've been a part of, and I've been a part of it all. Hmm. So I'm not saying that this is like a new leaf turned over. I'm just saying for whatever reason, so it they, is. They, they pretty much wrote the compromise bill, though, and then they. They were a big part of it. Away. They were yeah. a big part of it, and I wouldn't say I would not agree with the, that they pretty much wrote it. Um, that would almost be a disservice to the people who actually. Well, libertas, I think negotiated with the church from what I heard. There, yeah, there were, Libertas is, is kind yeah, of way they're still a huge the part of this. They're still yeah. a huge part of this, and those are people that we work with day in and day out. So there's no one person who's been like the single source of this change. There's been a number of people who uh, these changes have been, in, uh, you know, brought up by and seen through, but as this dialogue has gotten further and further, um, day by day, week by week, month by month, the group has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and now there's a lot of people involved. Um, so, but the church, and maybe we want to wait to, <laughs> to, to publicize this piece, because I don't, I don't want to like jinx us or anything like that. <laughs> you laugh, but, um, but they haven't, 
and, and I'm not. Yeah. Well, that's great. They have. That's good to hear. So, yeah. So we'll shift gears. We're gonna take a little break. Sure. When we get back, we'll shift gears and we'll talk about the opportunities that mm -hmm. exist for entrepreneurs from the background that you have and that what is likely gonna make this product a lot more competitive in the marketplace. Right. So when we get back, we'll get into that. Great. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I, I, know, I think that's probably hard for people to believe, but they literally have not said a damn pee. And I was almost like, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, because if they... just give a big thanks and a shout out to all of the volunteers, the organizers, the vendors, the sponsors of our amazing Made in Utah Festival. It was just this past weekend and by all measures it was a great success. Um, it's our yearly festival where we celebrate the best of local Utah. We celebrate the whole concept that uh, the social fabric the best part of our communities are the locally owned businesses, the, the makers, everybody who's involved in local agriculture and food and making products came out to this and it was really a lot of fun. So thanks everybody who took part in it and uh, we hope to see you at our winter fest which will be, we're trying, to, we're trying to solidify the date but it's looking like the end of November or beginning of December. So with that we're back with uh, Drew Rigby mm -hmm. and um, your official title is what? Uh, I think officially it's Director of Industrial Hemp and Medical Cannabis Programs, Department of Agriculture and Food. And that's, that <coughs> is a role that never existed until mm -hmm. just a couple months ago. Yeah. But it is probably, there's probably an equivalent role in every state that has medical cannabis. Is yeah, that? it's interesting how states that decide to divvy uh, this kind of authority regulation up. There's cannabis control, cannabis enforcement, Department of Health, Department of Ag. Yeah, it, it just kind of depends from state to state on what their program looks like and how they decide to actually house it, so to speak. So mm -hmm. um, Utah lawmakers decided to give authority to both the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health, uh, which pretty much oversees the entire medical program. 
um, Department of Public Safety has a little bit of um, right to know certain things, but and then yeah, the Department of Ag oversees the entire industrial hemp program, start to finish. So, and so did that open up a whole huge new wing to the Department of Agriculture? Is that going to be a big? It's been it's a uh, lot of people. It's, it's a uh, it's a busy place, for sure these days. I I, I think it's a, a change of pace, and a change of what normal was for the Department of Agriculture for decades because agriculture in the United States has been on a downward kind of negative slope as far as losing jobs and opportunities to other countries around the globe. Uh, this is one area where jobs are being created and added and money is flowing into agriculture versus flowing out of agriculture. So that's a change um, and then just maybe the overall spirit of like having hope that something something good, something positive is happening has been a change uh, too for the Department of Ag for sure. But I mean, there's still, um, there are programs that are housed at the Department of Ag that uh, don't get any credit and have never gotten any credit for the work they do, but are such a core, essential part of, uh, of, of our lives that we really don't even know about. So mm -hmm. uh, the people of the Department of Ag before cannabis ever came around uh, actually are a really stellar group of people. And, my hats off to them for the work they do. They're very hard workers. So yeah, yeah. Well, we love writing about farmers, and yeah. the way I kind of look at this, it's like you eventually, obviously, there's a there's a lot of big players now mm -hmm. entering into the market, and mm -hmm. they're most of them are going up to Canada because yeah. they have national legalization. Mm -hmm. But when you look at food in general, the way it's kind of moving is. In a lot of spaces, it's being decommodified. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're, you want small scale tomato farms that can grow heirlooms and organic, right. mm -hmm. and that gives a, a hand up to the the, the small growers right. who can handle that. The same goes for wineries and, mm -hmm. and grapes, and the same goes for certain kinds of um, fruit and peaches and things that we like here. So right. the way I look at medical cannabis is because there are so many different kinds of strains that do so many different types of things, right. that really opens up a lot of opportunity to the growers who really know what they're doing in terms of yeah. understanding the seeds, the varieties, and how to plant and produce properly. Is yeah. that how you guys look at it too? Or? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I don't see the cannabis industry peaking or being stagnant innovation-wise or genetically speaking for a really, really long time. I mean, we're talking about a market that is just um, at inception, even though cannabis has existed for centuries, millennia, uh, and so forth, going back further. Um, well, we've kind of co-evolved with cannabis, yeah, right? Yeah, and the always, cannabinoid system. It was system, always something right. we had with us. Yeah, so but so. outside of that, you know, when the federal government decided to schedule this substance back in the late 30s, 40s, um, it really kind of stifled innovation um, technology-wise in the space and, and the growth of, uh, or the opportunities for cannabis itself, right? Mm -hmm. Now that that lid's been ripped off, so to speak, in, in some sense, um, you're seeing just yeah, a lot more opportunities, and so I think, you know, these strains like the heirloom tomatoes and all these varietals and different cultivars and stuff like that, yeah, I, we haven't seen anything yet, so to speak. Um, I think there's going to be really, really good innovation for years and decades to come because every cannabinoid, in theory, should have some therapeutic effect, right? Mm -hmm. And if people are being honest in the cannabis space, we really don't even know what CBD really does to the fullest extent right like we know we know it's efficacy yeah it's efficacy in some areas but we don't really know the the downside so how can you say you really know a substance if you really only see the positive versus what downsides there may or may not be I'm not saying that there are downsides to CBD I'm just saying that we always hear about these great things we, we don't necessarily pay much attention to like the downsides right there's probably a downside to everything. How severe it is, who knows, I don't know, whatever. But all these different cannabinoids haven't really been tested and haven't been trialed and, and you know, researched. So it's gonna take decades to figure that stuff out. So hopefully, ideally, there's a lot of, you know, little treasures and secrets locked away in a lot of those cannabinoids that 
can replace some of the uh, synthetics that maybe we use way too common these days. So Yeah, and I think that's exactly it. And and just for the people who are listening or watching who don't know, how would you explain the endocannabinoid system <laughs> in a nutshell? I don't even know if I should attempt to try to explain the endocannabinoid system. I would probably leave that up to a medical professional or some PhD, but basically like we were getting at is the endocannabinoid system evolved within our bodies for thousands, millions of years, right? And so our bodies at some point were built to deal with these cannabinoids by some mode of ingestion or participation or something, right? Mm -hmm. And so all these different cannabinoids have different reactions within the endocannabinoid system and produce different effects. And so, um, yeah, I think that's what leads us to be really optimistic that uh, our bodies are built to, to use these substances somehow, some way. Yeah, we have so, the receptors built in, correct. and and it can be argued, well, we have receptors for nicotine, right. we have us for right. alcohol, right. for opioids too. Right. right. But the nice the nice thing about the endocannabinoid system is there's a plethora of different cannabinoids that we have receptors for, correct. and there are minimal side effects. Right? Well, yeah, and then you talk about ratios of formulation, you know, uh, cannabinoid to cannabinoid to cannabinoid, and you know the different formulations thereof of all these different cannabinoids you're going to get a different reaction so I just yeah I I mean I hope I live to be a hundred plus years old and I'd be blown away if we've tapped out this 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 piece by the time I pass away I just I don't know how I just you know it's uh, there's such a small absolute value or absolute percentage of science that we actually understand like mm -hmm. how can we ever assume that we and there were so few yeah. people doing the right. research while it was prohibition right exactly I mean, so it's like it's it just doesn't make sense little space of people it's it's got to uh, extend past our our lifetime our kids lifetimes and and may, who knows even even if it does come to an end at, at least there's going to be some good therapeutic uses medicinal uses and and um, stuff like that that people can rely on rather than having to default or source back to synthetics, which is an ugly situation. So. Yeah, and, and related to that, um, do you see the, the majority of the opportunity in the cultivar space when you look at this as an, as an overall market that's going to be burgeoning in the next few years? Well, when you say breeding. cultivars, I, my mind goes to genetics, breeding. Uh, are you talking about cultivation or yeah, actual cult cultivars? Cult cultivation and, and growing okay. it and finding strains that are going to be uniquely suited for different problems yeah. that people have. Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and I think that's where, look, the, the people, when you, when you lay out the supply chain, the people who make the first coin, the first dollar, are the genetic breeders, the people who are or um, uh, breeding these these lines, uh, different strains, so to speak, right? Because they're producing seeds or clones, they get paid before anybody else. So first and foremost, if there's an opportunity, like <laughs> that's maybe where you should think about starting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, there's, there's just a constant evolution of strains and um, genetics that are being and I, I don't mean to use the word engineered like they're being manufactured, but they're being engineered in the sense that they're being manipulated and expressing different traits here and there and reducing or um, uh, extinguishing traits here and there that aren't desired, right? That's all manipulation that we've done in all sorts of different things throughout you know, human history. So yeah, there's a huge opportunity. The, the, the thing here when it comes to genetics is it's a very you have to know what you're doing. You have to be a very skilled person to know what you're doing and actually get results. Um, so if that's not your thing, and maybe you don't understand the science there, cultivation would probably be the next step. It's the lowest barrier to entry by way of capital needs in order to actually get up and running. And that's not to say that there aren't capital needs, but you can scale down and grow uh, to, mac to meet your, your budget, so to speak. Uh, you don't need two John Deere's and an irrigation system and stuff like that and a fertilization and nutrient system to get up and going on the hemp side. And I'll compare the hemp as if it were medical cannabis as, or as if it were cannabis and anyone could grow it, right? But, um, but yeah, that's, that's probably the lowest barrier to entry, cultivation. I mean, there's still really good opportunity. The next step up will be processors, which is very capital intensive if you're actually going to uh, actually produce any kind of volume and any kind of high quality desired product, there, there's a lot of capital needs at, uh, at stake. And then 
Um, probably in between cultivation and processing would be, you know, retail. You can put up a retail stand for, for fairly cheap, you know. Uh, your product is kind of going to drive your sales there, the quality of your product and your ability to market yourself and stuff like that. So <coughs> and there's, there's plenty of opportunities, and I know we're going back and forth from medical cannabis to industrial hemp as examples, but I guess we have to because not everyone can play in the medical cannabis space. So. Yeah, and it's, and it's a lot more cap capital intensive Correct. for medical cannabis than industrial hemp for sure, right? Correct, yeah. And you're competing with a lot of different groups and outside interests and things like that. Yeah, the market, I don't, I don't know if it's fair to say it's saturated. It's saturated by by way of numbers, or by way of number of people trying to get in. But I think, and I'm not trying to be an asshole, for, I don't even know no, if I can <laughs> um, But there's a lot of people in both spaces that aren't sophisticated uh, operators and don't necessarily what, know what they're doing. And I'm, I'm not making a judgment call or anything. Well, I guess I kind of am. But I guess what I'm saying is that it's saturated by way of numbers. There, it's not saturated by way of people who actually know what they're doing and are effective, efficient operators. Mm -hmm. There's still if you really know what exactly. you're doing and you know the market, yes. you know how to do There's it. There's still right. opportunity. There's plenty of opportunity. Yeah, and I think those are the areas where it's like, look, if you can be a really effective boutique grower and, you know, uh, get your hands on a really desirable strain and grow some some plants and some flowers, sell it to processors or sell the smokable flower out of state for consumption. And you can make pretty good coin, um, but it's a lot harder than it sounds. So yeah. Easier said than done. So, yeah, yeah execution is a, uh, is, a, is a different reality than just kind of talking about it and putting together some some money and going out and getting seeds and finding a place to plant. It's, it's much more difficult than that. But that doesn't mean that people can't do it. If you have the will and the, and the determination and the willingness to admit your weaknesses <laughs> where you have them and sharpen those and see it, you know, see it through, you'll succeed. Yeah, and the the part that I'm I'm interested in is so the in medical cannabis currently you cannot ship across state lines because of the Schedule Correct. One Correct. designation, and yeah, so yeah. everybody has to grow their own medical cannabis in each state, and so that creates a little bit of a problem because nobody in Utah has ever grown medical cannabis before, and. I mean legally. <laughs> well, and there there's people who originate or are native from Utah who have been outside of the state and growing. That's and true. Coming back. Yeah, that's, that's true. So but that's you can't say there were existing farmers in Utah. No. Who, like who no, could just like say, oh yeah, I'm gonna no. do it. Yeah. And and so the the issue that we had with the cultivator licenses was that we totally need people who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And we need them to produce volume because at a low estimate, I heard there will be about thirty-five thousand people who will, will will be getting their recommendation cards right from the get-go, and that's a pretty big market. Not make. from the get-go. Well, I don't I don't know what uh, what study you might be thinking about. I, think I was just reading like that it was. Uh, it was going to be one to two percent of the population. Yeah, that would be over a time horizon of like four to five <coughs> years. Oh, really? Is that yeah, not, not. I mean, that would be great for business and a great success for the program overall. If we had thirty-five thousand patients in year one, I'd be high-fiving uh, people left and right, like we did it. You know? Yeah. Uh, that's not going to be the case. So, and, what are your expectations? Then? Uh, you know, uh, that's that's interesting. There's so many variables, and I know that this is such a cop-out of an answer, but I'm not giving you a cop-out answer because I don't want to answer it. I'm giving you a, somewhat of a cop-out answer because no one knows. Yeah. No one I knows. I mean, there's just so many variables. If you told me that some of the variables from the onboarding process would be removed, I could maybe give you a higher degree of confidence answer. But like, well, according to these stats that uh, that can be extrapolated from other states uh, that have similar programs, we would see this type of a nature, this type of a, a velocity at which patients onboard. Because every program is so different and mm -hmm. the variables and the details are so different, I just like, it. I, I'm hoping, yes. yeah, I'm hoping that we have eight to 10,000 patients by the end of year one. I'd be really happy with that. Um, if we could keep it like a, you know, eight to, 20, eight to 12,000 clip per year, 
up to five years where we kind of peak out at you know 50 to 60,000 patients. Um, I, I kind of have to work under that premise under, under the assumption that the medical uh, conditions list is, is, is what it is, it's not changing. I mean, and they're not, they're not allowing autoimmune disorders. Not right, right now. Right now. And so that's not, uh, this, is not, this is not a statement on the list itself. I have to operate as if that's not changing. Mm -hmm. And when I make assumptions, right, when we're sitting across from each other and we're making assumptions on what the program may or may not look like, I'm, I'm going to try not to factor in all those changes that may or may not happen. Mm -hmm. But if, if the program is as is, like it is today, five years from now, and we have upwards of 50 to 60,000 patients, I think we've succeeded in creating a program in which product or, or medicine is efficiently distributed to patients and patients are medicating um, at, at good, acceptable numbers. And now, that's about 2%. Right? Yeah, roughly, that's about on average. And, and that would be the number or the piece of data that we would fall back on that is kind of, um, you know, looked at from state to state to state in medical only programs where the average is anywhere from two to three percent. So, you know, a standard deviation or two from our target, we're going to be in the ballpark. Yeah. But again, it's so hard. Like yeah, I, I would think that would be extremely difficult to get from other states because so many other states started with the medical only mm -hmm. and then they go into recreational. Right. And do you know what the total population or the total percentage of the population that use both recreation and medical? Yeah, that's is? where that's where things get tricky, and we you almost have to stop the comparison because it's not. Yeah, it's not valid. It's not anymore. fair. It's not valid, right? So it's interesting because we're surrounded by states that are very West Coast esque type of programs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're very much like an East Coast program in the sense that we don't have unlimited number of licenses. It's more of a restricted program, and again, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with that reality. I'm just saying we are kind of like this little island, so to speak, amongst you know all these people on the West Coast who have very liberal, open medical programs, and the medical programs really aren't even used much anymore. I mean, the medical programs in these other states that surround us are mostly used because the product goes tax-free. There's, there's very little tax or no tax on these products, or there's less tax on the medical pro product, than, or medical, the medicine, ra as compared to the recreational product, right? And so that's why people might go that way. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot of incentive to go through a medical program when you can buy it recreational. Yeah, I, was, I, would, I would think kind that, of and, that's, and that's the difficulty, I guess, of the space, because a lot of people are currently medicating, mm -hmm. legitimately, mm -hmm. Correct. And they're going across state lines to get their product, right. or they have a source on the black market. Mm -hmm. And I would see that your role primarily is to convince these existing patients that they should come into to the realm of legality, right? Yeah. Or is that is that the stated goal at all? Or uh, I would agree with the I would agree with that premise indirectly, but that's not like the core function of my job. I really see my the core function of my job is to, to build and create a program that can efficiently function uh, and, and grow, produce, and distribute product. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really look at the black market or the other states as if we're If we're doing a good job, if we're doing a good job and we're, and we're effective um, creators, so to speak, um, we should win some of those people yeah. into the program, right, indirectly. So... It's not a driving factor. Uh, we're not. Um, we're not lost on the fact that there's a black market. There will always be a black market. I don't think this is a response to the black market. This is a response to the fact that people need medicine and they should be able to uh, medicate uh, without fear of legal ramifications. Yeah. So let's create a space in which they can do that. If people want to buy black or legal, uh, sh shit, that's up to them, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're, if if we've created a program in which pricing is so much higher than black market, we've failed. Yeah. So let's be honest about that, that's that's just reality. So I don't- And lawmakers know that too, right? Yeah, I mean, um, we talk about it, uh, but that's the challenge is that um, there's a lot of uh, data points that I said that we can borrow from other states to create
create assumptions that like, hey, this is where we should be. But because this is the first time that this has ever happened in the state of Utah under the law that has been created in Utah, no one really knows. Yeah, and, and one of the biggest variables I see is that, yeah, you can go get a recommendation card mm -hmm. from a doctor in Utah, mm -hmm. but if other states have better resources for both getting a good diagnosis and a good strain mm -hmm. that you can trust, there's no mechanism to stop people from going across state lines to get a better product, right? Yeah, I mean, most likely what would happen is those strains would make their way to Utah. Um, those, we would hope. Yeah, we would hope. Strains, strains flow quite freely, yeah. um, whether, whether, whether their originators like it or not, right? Mm -hmm. They flow pretty freely because it's very difficult to control a genetic once it's outside of your hands. Uh, if you have a viable plant, you can clone it, tissue culture it, and you're gone. Like that strains off into the market, right? So, um, so yeah, it might take a year or two to make it way to Utah, but um, I, I guess I, I don't I don't doubt that there's going to be strains that people want. Like now, we want we want that product here right now. Well, it's going to be the cultivator's job to go figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. So I, I, I'm very much against the state getting involved in businesses and telling them how to run their operation. Like if we build a program in which, uh, yeah, these, these, the patients should thrive, right? They should be able to get what they want. But there's, there's always gonna be a natural lag to like how fast products are coming onto the market, right? And that's just a function of entrepreneurialism and how fast these people source the genetics Right and have a pulse on the market what the what the patients want. So yeah, and I would think that I would hope that the doctors who are prescribing medical cannabis, they really actually know the strains and yeah. they know what they're talking about because mm -hmm. one of the problems I think that exists in the Utah model is mm -hmm. you're calling them medical cannabis pharmacies. You're you have to have be a licensed pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Pharmacists aren't taught about medical cannabis in pharmacy school. Yeah, and unfortunately, neither of the doctors. So uh, the 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 idea behind that uh, that decision was that, um, and and I can empathize or not empathize, sympathize with with the thought here, is that if doctors don't feel comfortable on how to prescribe dosing parameters, they didn't want that to be a deal breaker. Like doctor, me, I'm a doctor. Uh, you know what? Since I don't feel comfortable with this this drug and how to dose it, I'm just not gonna write scripts, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than have that type of a situation, they added this space in which the doctor has to write the recommendation, but either the pharmacist or the doctor can prescribe the dosing parameters. And this goes back to that mantra of, if it's a medicine, then let's treat it like a medicine. There are pros and cons to that approach. This, and from your point of view, would be one of the cons saying that, well, because it's a medicine, we treat it like a medicine, therefore we have to have a pharmacist. That's unnecessary, mm -hmm. right? And the pharmacist doesn't necessarily exactly. know so, anything about it. So, but at the same time, on the other side of the coin, because it's a medicine and we treat it like a medicine, <laughs> we have the medicine, yeah. right? So it's like the chicken and the egg, I get it. Um, okay. However, nobody, nobody's gonna OD on any of this. Like, to have such a mm -hmm. big deal on what dosing is, it's a waste of money. Like, well, I, I think there's a responsibility uh, uh, or a liability, a risk that they're trying to somewhat mitigate. Um, and again, you gotta, you gotta. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just simply trying to come from their point of view and saying this is what they're concerned about. While we might not have concerns about that, they have concerns about it. And if it's something that we have to acquiesce. Uh, or, or give up on in order to, to have a program, that's not a bad that's not a bad place to to seat on concede on. So, um, yeah, having pharmacists in uh, retail storefronts will increase the price of the product because that's ultimately an additional expense to the bottom line. Um, but it's not it's not going to be a deal breaker, so to speak. It should it, it should be such a small incremental addition that it's not but but I agree I, I just don't have 
answer. Like it's and, and I kind of yeah, see it's a that medical as, program. unfortunately so someone as, as being one of the compromises that is actually kind of a poison pill because if there is a medical cannabis mm -hmm. doctor who mm -hmm. really knows his shit mm -hmm. and knows the strains and varieties, I would think everybody would want to go yeah. to that guy. Mm -hmm. But then they put a provision in saying that each doctor can only write so many scripts because they don't want to have a medical cannabis expert yeah. writing lots of recommendations and having, this, all the, having all the knowledge. This is where I would, I would, um, I would encourage everyone to be, be, be uh, optimistically patient because you have to consider like where we're coming from. Uh, we had no program a year ago, and now we have a program. And within six months, this program is getting turned upside down on its head and rebuilt. So I always say that this today is the worst you'll ever see this program. It'll continue to get better and better and better. And it'll get better and better and better from your perspective, from my perspective, from the lawmaker's perspective, from everyone's perspective, it will continue to get better. And if you don't believe that, just look at the last no, I, six I months, believe right? it's better. Yeah, so it was it was designed to right. fail. And I'm not going to argue. I'm. It was, I, I don't think that program. If we had it, it I can I can assure you it, that it would have. Okay, no, I, I would agree with you there, but I can assure you that it wasn't designed to fail, but it would have failed. Yeah. And so I think people need to be careful about uh, skepticism is a good thing. It's a very good thing. I, I, I'm an advocate of being skeptical and always second guessing things and uh, trying to judge things at face value and reading them for what they are. But in this area, no one has been super malicious. Uh, and I've said it on these meetings. And that's no, not I don't think it's like, mal. I think it's just <clears throat> plain stupidity. Like yeah, because okay, we had 34 fair. states before us that's do fair. medical cannabis. Why not learn from right. them? But, Why not have dispensaries with experts working at those mm -hmm. dispensaries and then let the market determine yeah. which dispensaries are right. actually good and legit. But we will have those doctors who develop those skills over time. And and yeah, I, I, I agree with you in a lot of different ways. But again, um, I'm not trying to... Yeah. yeah, you're not here to defend the law. Well, yeah, and, and I got to be careful because I, I sometimes can... Yeah, um, but... I, again, I'll just go back to I just I, I feel fortunate that we've all played a part, all three of us have played a part in some shape or fashion in bringing cannabis to people who need it. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like that's the most important thing. So. What is your personal experience with medical cannabis? <laughs> like, how did you become a believer? I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. I I always I've always swam upstream in everything I do, so I just I'm used to going against the grain, and I think it's fair to say this is against the grain in, in Utah in my culture like I and you you're originally from Utah yeah man. born well not but exactly you went born. to California to get involved in medical cannabis yeah so. that's where that's where the, the, the business started but yeah I grew up in the avenues and grew up here locally and married locally and went to school locally and I I, I don't know like you just look in, in my personal life in my personal opinion I don't understand why the two contradict each other and when I say the two I'm talking about my personal religious beliefs and no, Canada's and right I now. think that's one of the coolest I things is that this was shit. an internal grassroots movement yeah. within within members of the church. That yeah. Nathan Frodsham, I interviewed him mm -hmm. after one of the meetings. Mm -hmm. He lived in Oregon, was lucky enough to get the medicine, mm -hmm. and it made an amazing difference in his life. He was able yeah. to sleep, he didn't have this back pain, and then he became such a chief advocate. Yeah. And the church was like, well, we can't like say this guy is a <laughs> pothead loser. <laughs> I think you, it can't, takes, you can't put that guy in a box. Look, there has been a stigma about cannabis for for decades now, going back probably to the 30s and 40s, and it's not hard to understand why when people grow up in a system, mm -hmm. uh, they they push that narrative, you know, under the next generation and so on and so on, and then slowly over time, you know, each generation kind of has some some skepticism of like you know what I, that doesn't sound right to me so on and so on. right we see this trend in every single generation right mm -hmm. so it's just maybe the natural occurrence and uh, natural occurrence or the natural timing of cannabis lifespan cannabis's lifespan and being accepted into you know the masses but look I have plenty of personal experience with all this stuff um, uh, I just I don't know I, I think in life everyone has to take a step back and make a, a personal assessment 
and at the end of the day you have to feel comfortable with whatever your personal assessment is 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 it is what it is and like you have to follow your own heart and you have to follow your conscience and um you know at the end of the day like i feel comfortable with myself i feel comfortable in my skin mm -hmm. i don't care if yeah. others critique me i i really don't give a shit like it, it i am who i am and i feel comfortable that way right so yeah. if if members of the church want to critique me or not i, I really don't care because I, there's just too much going on in life to give a shit, right? So, um, I look and I respect their point of view. I respect, you know, obviously I hope they respect my point of view, but at the end of the day, like, what does it matter? I, it, what does it matter? Yeah. I'm going to do what I want to do. I hope that you get to do what you do. Live and let live. Like, my personal beliefs are my personal beliefs, and there's kind of like this protective bubble around it. Like, dude, like, we can share every space together, but like, I'm not going to tell you how to live. Don't tell me how to live. Um, and let's just coexist, right? And so... But in essence, the church does that. I mean, they legislate morality. And yeah. I actually defend that practice. I, I had um, Rod Decker on the program, mm -hmm. and I said, if you, if we live in a democratic republic, which we do, and mm -hmm. you elect, you know, hardcore Mormons to be yeah. in the state legislature, you're gonna get, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get hardcore <laughs> politics. Yeah, you're right? going to get you're going to get the legislation of morality yeah and and that's what i mean welcome to utah but that's what i tell people but yeah and that's okay with me yeah but where i draw the line uh -huh. is where you see policy start sure. to get into economics there, and dominating absolutely the there has to, I, I am 100 percent with you there has to be a separation between state and church and i will i would defend that to death right like i just don't ever want to live in a society where the two are commingled and I understand that those lines may be blurred yeah. or are blurred. Especially when the church is trying to dominate sectors of the economy or dominate right. retail and at a local level. Right. But especially in this space where it's so promising for patients, people on opioids right. right now suffering so much, they could use medical cannabis instead. Yeah. But that and that's the thing about life is that everyone interprets X uniquely. Yeah. And the gospel to me means something probably pretty different than what it means to my friends or my family or or whoever we're talking about and who am i to say that like my god is actually the true god but yours isn't right like i'm not getting into that space like because at the end of the day I, I truly believe that we're all going to back to the same place wherever that place is like i feel like we're all going there we don't have a choice right yeah. and and above and beyond that like who cares like um I, I think civility is needed in this day and age, and I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Swimming upstream, uh, you, it seems like you guys probably swim upstream too. It's just, I don't know. I'm comfortable doing it, and I prefer doing it. If I'm ever with the masses, I'm one of the asses. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we just like to look at things, uh, hopefully objectively, yeah, right, and evaluate what's really going on, mm -hmm. and not not come to conclusions about motives like right. I didn't want to assume anything is malicious yeah no but I a lot of but a lot of a lot of decisions that have happened in Utah I think come out of ignorance and it's right. just understanding what it is we're actually talking about right. here and I think the promise of medical marijuana is that is that cannabis and the cannabinoid system if you actually begin to understand it mm -hmm it could replace a huge chunk of synthetic yeah. pharmaceuticals. And I think the reason why there is a lot of fear associated with it is not only because of the propaganda campaign that happened before mm -hmm. Prohibition, mm -hmm. but it's also this idea that it's going to dramatically change right. the economy. It's, it's, going to it's going to change the way people look at pharmaceuticals. Yeah. It's going uh, to look, it's going to, be downstream probably a pharmaceutical be sure to try this strain of, right. of a cannabinoid before right. you try Paxil because yeah, that might right. work better no yeah there's always these conspiracies that in, in fairness we shouldn't call them conspiracies because that like has a negative notation to it mm -hmm. but there are the, I'm sure there are some of those energies at force behind the scenes that well, none of us are privy to there's billions of dollars right. at play here absolutely of course there of course it's there naive is. to think otherwise absolutely but um, yeah, at the end of the day, we still have a program to run, and we still have, and that's the cool thing about the feds staying out of this for now. There's both pros and cons that we get to kind of like develop our own program locally, 
state by state, yeah. and there's not a lot of those billions of dollars in Utah at work. That was Brigham Young's dream. <laughs> to have local self-reliant communities yeah. where we can cultivate everything we need ourselves. Yeah, and see, that's the thing is like, if we think ignorance is is, is bad now, I mean, I just, gosh, <laughs> I don't even want to know what it was like back then, right? Like I, oh, so, I think he was a little bit more wise. He had his own right, distillery and brewery. Right, and well, and that's what I'm saying is like, I don't know, maybe, maybe ignorance is relative to each generation. I don't know, right? But yeah. um, uh, that's, yeah, I just... But I, you know, along those lines, we had on our, our program a guest um, named Lyle Christensen. Mm -hmm. You probably heard yeah. of him, the Viking yeah. farmer. I, I don't and know he I, was I, hardcore wanting to get a grow mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. And I, I understood he wanted to try to grow outdoors yeah. just based on the criteria. I know you you guys had a point system and you weren't involved directly mm -hmm. in the in the choosing. But why would that model not work for uh, it really didn't have anything to do with whether you're growing indoor or outdoor or or greenhouse. It had to do with the business proposal that was put forth. Um, That's really what it came down to. And is, is your ability to uh, think critically about the questions that were asked and, and respond appropriately uh, with enough um, information and backing to support your answer, right? I think that's where people got filtered through. Is just maybe not putting as much time into this as as, as was necessary. I mean, because it was a very competitive situation. There were yeah. eighty-one applicants, and um, um, there, it was a very competitive process. And so you're competing against everyone else, and you're only as good as that next person is, right? And so on and so on and so on. So um, why we, only eight instead of ten? So Utah has some of the highest uh, production thresholds in the nation. So when you think about states like Colorado, California, <coughs> and Washington, they've released thousands of, uh, of cultivation uh, licenses, 1,200, 1,300, 1,500. Yeah. Those licenses are quarter acre, half acre, full acre. <coughs> They're, depending on the area and what state you're in, there is some what we call stacking. So you can get multiple licenses and stack them in one in the, in the same area. So you could turn like a half grow, a half acre grow into uh, an acre with two licenses and so on and so on, mm -hmm. right? Some areas that's, that's great. You got thousands of licenses, it, right? But so, yeah, but the why. point here is that uh, they're, they're playing a different type of numbers game, where they're releasing a lot of small licenses. Where Utah, and this is what the lawmakers chose to do, is release a limited number of licenses and have really high thresholds. So in Utah, if you do an outdoor grow, you can have a four acre, up to a four acre grow. That's a very, I mean, the, if we had all eight grows, we, we'd probably have um, some of the largest grows in the nation for sure, outdoors. Uh, indoors is 100,000 square feet. If you're an indoor grower, you can get four, five. Up to 100,000 square feet? Up to 100,000 square probably feet. probably a minimum of what, 50,000 to be even considered? Yeah, I mean, no, no, we didn't necessarily say um, well, you told us, you know, you know, we gave you more points because you said you were going to go 30,000 30, square feet versus 35,000 square feet. We didn't really get into that. That wasn't a scoring criteria in of itself. But again, going back to the overall macro plan and your ability to answer technical questions, mm -hmm. right? If, if you want to be one of the licensees in Utah, <clears throat> you have to be able to answer these questions and you have to be able to answer them thoroughly and back it up back it up. In other words, you have to have growing experience. No, right? not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You this can is... go from tomatoes to marijuana? Why not? If, the, if they can answer the questions. Yeah, why not? Why not? And this is not rocket science. I mean, there's an art to this, no doubt. And people who have growing experience have an edge on people who don't, right? They, they, have, uh, they have a head start. That's for sure, without a doubt, 10 out of 10 times. But the statement saying that if you don't have growing experience, you couldn't have gotten a license is just not true, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you have to be business savvy. You have to be entrepreneurial. You have to, you know, have a good reputation of delivering, um, meeting deadlines, and you have to be able to present yourself. You have to be able to present your cause, your your pitch, uh, and you have to be able to answer these technical questions. A question so. you probably can't answer, but. You can ask it. You can mm -hmm. just say, I can't answer that. Go for it. The people you chose, mm -hmm. do, do you know whether or not they hired a company to come and write their proposal for them? 
I don't. Uh, I'm sure. So, uh, I'm not sure. I'm positive. Um, I would not say. I would not put it in those terms. Because wouldn't consultants. wouldn't a consultant be able to really make it sound Absolutely. like this person is a great fit if you just hired him, pay him ten grand, write your proposal? Absolutely, and I, I've heard that people were paying more. I don't know who those companies were. I purposely don't want to like be have biased. You have a way to sniff through that. If that well, I mean, my personal experience, like it's it's pretty easy to figure out whether people know what they're talking about or not very quickly. Because if I'm maybe if you talk to them face to face, but on a proposal, no, can no you even a proposal, I could put I could put together a proposal that I could take to any state and feel very confident that I would get a license because I can I can I can prove my expertise through data, right? Uh, through um, qualitative information, not just qualitative information, right? So it's 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 it's. For me, I have experience, it's easier probably than someone who doesn't. Now we yeah. had a panel of six people. Um, not everyone on that panel had cannabis experience, but um, they, were, they, were, they were educated on what to look for. And after you re review 81 applications of hundreds of pages each, we had one that was 1,200 pages. I mean, I spent, we all spent our July 4th uh, doing this stuff. Like, we didn't, I, we didn't leave like our little like cages forever for weeks like, like this was this was top priority it's all good right it's, it's part of the job we we knew it was coming we expected it and we wanted to do our part and make sure we were fair um <clears throat> so so yeah i just uh um sorry i forget you, what we were exactly well you just i i just i just kind of was curious like how you could possibly i mean and, and i know from your finance background mm -hmm. you could probably vet the applicants based oh, on yeah, the, consultants. the legitimacy of <clears throat> like their bank records, right. their financial records, you probably look right. at that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, no, and somebody can't fake that, obviously. Yeah, and so I, I don't I don't know that there was any one group who came in and just said, hey, I'm gonna write you, I'm gonna cut you a check for X amount of dollars, and I'm, I want you to put everything together and just tell me what I should do. Mm -hmm. I don't think that happened. Most often, consultants come in and they say, hey, I know the Utah landscape, or I know how to play this game. I know what the regulators are looking for, I know the answers to these questions in great detail that will look really good on paper, right? So they come in and they do that, and then they become part of the team, whether they have equity ownership or they're paid for a fee for service kind of a thing. Like I don't know what their arrangement is, right? Uh, they might have been on the, uh, the the deck or not. I don't know. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there's a scoring system, and this is this is the way Utah does it. There's a scoring system. It's predetermined what it's like, it's released to the public, here's what we're looking for, here are the scoring criteria. So you, you have an answer sheet and you have the question sheet. Now bring us your best proposal, right? And so I think you'd be surprised to see uh, like a natural distribution of the proposals, the quality of the proposals themselves, to see kind of like that scatter plot of where everything came in. There were, there were a lot of companies that I would have felt comfortable giving a license to, but at the end of the day, uh, we went with eight because we have these higher thresholds, and uh, and um, let me let me let me say something very clearly. Regardless of how many licenses we issued, eight or ten or four, regardless of that number, we will see a short. Uh, we will see a um, uh, how do I want to put it? A um, we will see a. Uh, sorry, I'm blanking will we, out. Will you see the the quantity anywhere no. near what it well, needs to be? No, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have a, a short term. We'll have some supply issues. Basically, is what I'll say. Yeah. Over the first couple of months, no matter what, because it's a function of getting these these licensees up and operational, right? Which means they have to go through the local permitting process. They have to go through the local authorities. They have to get all their permits. Then they have to build out their operations. Right, regardless of if I issued eight or ten or four, like we're gonna have a short term uh, a lack of supply for the yeah. first couple of months, right? And eight of them are doing that right now. Eight, eight of them are doing, doing that right now. They're in the process. So, so that needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. um, that that there is gonna be a shortage, if you will, of product for the first couple of months, and that's regardless of how many licenses I issued. We, you know, as <clears throat> as we get into you know months six to twelve and further on. We will start to see larger and larger and larger amounts of quantity that will that could and will far exceed the demand of the patient base. So you don't know that for sure, though, do you? Uh, I know that 
We're going to say I know that. that I know. I, no, no, no. I would never say I <laughs> guarantee it. I know that with more of a surety than any other decision I've had to make. Okay. So <clears throat> you got to think about uh, how much how much THC does it actually take to medicate a person? How many patients are we going to have? How much product do we need to grow? How many licenses do we have? What's their capacity levels? What's the size of their operations? And it probably the price it's a form, has a big. It's factor. a formula. Yeah. It's a formula. And then you, <clears throat> and then you factor in, you know, uh, 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 an attrition rate, uh, different rates for product being tied up yeah. in inventory and not being on on the mark uh, on the shelves. Is it's not that's the easy part of the job. The yeah. executing is the difficult part of the job. Is making sure everybody hits timelines and deadlines and everything like that. So. So. I want to get into what it's going to be like to be a potential patient. We'll probably mm -hmm. just spend about 10 minutes on that, but I'll yeah. take a little break first. Yeah, for sure. So we can tell all of our viewers and listeners what we can expect to uh, if you go to a doctor and want to be a patient when we come back. So if, if patients want more information, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, I think we have a cannabis uh, webpage that's a joint webpage between Department of Health and Department of Ag. I think it's live. Uh, we've been working on it for the last couple of months. I think they just went live. Um, uh, I can send you the link for that website. Otherwise, it's going to be sourced at the Department of Ag and Department of Health directly. Um, but again, this is part of building the program is that this website will be, will, I'm pretty sure it's live, so I'll, I'll yeah. verify yeah, and we'll pass that away. In the show yeah. notes. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, uh, I can send you more links on where to find the bill and um, uh, the, the statutes as they sit right now. Obviously, the cat's out of the bag. People already know there, there may be a special session addressing some of the, uh, the court issues with the bill as it uh, sits now. And that will most likely happen pretty soon. So. And very likely more patients will get involved and make their voices be heard. I hope so. I mean, I... It's part of the democratic process. Like stand up and and be a part of the be a part of the narrative for sure. So I hope so. I really do. Yeah, I encourage people to get involved because this is one area where your voice can actually make a difference. Absolutely, and and I see that every single day. And I don't mean that like uh, as like let's build bridges and look at rainbows. Like I mean that like I literally uh, people call in all the time and give us ideas and some of them actually make sense like I'm like all right yeah that's actually you know let's uh, let me see where I can go with that so yeah voices uh, voices matter in this one so all right well thanks a yeah, lot for likewise. being on the show I really appreciate it yeah, yeah. I appreciate it the Utah story show is brought to you in part by legends pub and grill it's locally owned and operated and serving up all your classic favorites and unique originals too they have amazing burgers, which I absolutely love. Their food is made with real wholesome, delicious ingredients, awesome appetizers, main dishes like steaks, sandwiches, salads, pizzas, calzones. And now they've got a very special new options for gluten-free and vegetarian folks. Finish off your meal with mouthwatering desserts. Plus they have a full bar, which offers all sorts of local craft beers. Um, I love their talented bartenders, their tasty creations, and check them out for an upcoming Utah Jazz game or U of U game. It gets rowdy in there, but it's an awesome environment to go check out a game. They recommend you call ahead and reserve space for your group, and they accommodate all ages. They now have two locations. Your downtown Salt Lake City location is at 677 South, 200 West, and their new Southtown location is at 10631 South Holiday Park Drive in Sandy, Utah. The Utah Stories podcast is brought to you in part by Curry Pizza. So Curry Pizza has been serving Indian food for over 10 years, and they came up with a twist of creation of putting curry sauces on pizzas. They opened their first location in a small town called Bicknell, Utah. It was called Binda's Curry Pizza Palace. When they began serving some incredible pizzas, such as chicken tiki masala pizza, with all of the fresh spices and ingredients of the old world, with fresh Italian sausage, spicy sausage, and they also offer a mango korma pizza. The Utah Story Show is brought to you by Curry Pizza, Paisley's Grass-Fed Beef, Utah State, home of the Aggies, 
Legend Sports Bar and Grill. We thank them for their support of this program.